Scratch it up. Pew, 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 so it's a shame you don't have like foot rest or something, you can really sort of chill out and go to sleep. Um, so I'm Sam Aaron, and this is John Graham, and we're Meta X. Um, we're gonna, we thought it'd be cool to give like about 10 minutes talking about what we're doing and our approach, and then we'll do a bit of music. And if that's enjoyable, you can enjoy that. If not, then the beers will probably make you enjoy it more. Um, so I am a researcher at the University of Cambridge, uh, and I was also a professional developer. Um, and I got fundamentally interested in uh, the where the inter disciplines combine. So, I'm super interested in programming. I'm wearing a programmer's t-shirt, just to, just to place that as an em emphasis. Um, but I'm also super interested in music, and I'm excited about to what extent programming can apply to music, and that music can transversely apply to programming. And so, actually, in my day job at the university, I'm working with the Raspberry Pi team, and I'm developing software for children to learn how to program using music as a vehicle to actually engage them. And that's going really well. And a lot of those ideas came from the work that we're doing here, which is sort of my night job, my, my exciting, this is what I like to do in my life kind of thing. So if anyone wants to pay me full time for this, and John, then, then please, uh, we'll call, talk to you afterwards. So what are we doing, and what, why is it exciting? And so the, the way I see it, I'm, I'm an open source developer. So the software I write is actually given to the public domain for people to use and to hack on and play with and to, to manipulate. And this has so many amazing benefits. So if I don't understand some certain bit of software, I can go and read the source, if it's open source, and understand it and develop my knowledge further, which means that I can potentially improve it or I can ask questions to the developer, they can improve it themselves. And, and through this ongoing manipulation of source code in a public domain, everyone, the world benefits. And actually, a large majority of the websites you look at are run on an uh, operating system called Linux, which is open source and being developed freely in people's free time. Uh, and also, there's lots of commercial applications, so com companies pay people to develop open source software because when they release it, they get ideas back. And we were wondering to what extent this can apply to music, and we're really quite excited about this. And so, the, the thing which really gets me excited is that I want to go to a cool concert. So uh, last night I was at Mode Selector, which was pretty cool, and the Roundhouse and Apparat, they, they were amazing. And I, there's two things I'd like to have from that. I mean, they're dreams, obviously. So the first one is I'd be able to actually go and chat with Mode Selector, say, hi, I'm Sam. Your mode selector, how is it going? Um, and then obviously, then the next question would be, can you show me the source code to your music? Right? Can I see how you created your music? Is it online? Is it freely available for me to look at, learn from, download, manipulate, mash up, share, and, ex and, and do all these amazing things that's only possible if it's in the public domain and if it exists as a formalized piece of text, which software is? And, and more to the point, right, in a 200 years' time, people can look at that software and they can study it. And they can say, this is how it was created. This is the, the process that the, 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 the composition was formed. This is how the synthesizer was designed. Whereas if you look at a lot of uh, our current electronic music, it's lost. There is no notation. There is no way to regain how that was created without trying to rebuild the actual tools from scratch somehow and make sure all the dials are set to the right te the, uh, uh, value and the room temperature is the same as the original place and like, the electricity is the same voltage and all these things you can't easily recreate. Whereas if your music uh, systems are created with text, then you just need to have a copy of that text and the systems which can read that text and turn it into music. And so this is what we're doing. How are we doing for time? Right, so, yeah, so what I'm interested in now is to, uh, well, how we can do this. And so I'm going to give you a quick five minutes to talk about how, how we do this, a very, very simple approach, and then we're going to make some music. And so, right, so the, what's the first thing we want to do? So we're developing software, so we create something called a namespace. Uh, and in here we say what our dependencies are. I don't know if you can read this on the screen. Is that readable to anybody? So the system I've been creating with a guy called Jeff Rose, something called Overtone, we've been developing it for four years. It's built on something called Super Collider, which you may have heard of. Um, and here I can uh, pull in, oh, hold on. Um, this is the thing about live coding, is like everything is completely random, and uh, you're not sure if it's going to work out or not, so bear with me. Um, so I'm going to just get a synth. So here's a synthesizer which I designed earlier, it's Blue Peter style. And this is, this is actually developed with code, so you can actually see uh, the code which describes this sound, which I'm going to play to you in a moment. Uh, but maybe you've heard of software like Maximus P or Pure Data, which gives you a visual form, and maybe that's more comfortable to you. So I can generate that visual form, so I can show the synthesizer spacey. And you 
can see it popping up on the screen. So here it is here in PDF. Make that a bit bigger. You can see it's quite a simple synth design. So there's things feeding into other things, feeding through other things, but ma ma maximum speed style. And you might say, well, why aren't we developing it like this? Because clearly that's much more easy to see and understand. Uh, however, uh, when you get to more interesting synths, uh, let's find this one. This is like the, a version of the TXX, THX sound simulation. Um, and when you get to this kind of system, you get a, a synth design like this. So I'm going to make this text a bit smaller. Uh, I'm actually even bigger. <laughs> uh, show. There we are. So here's, the, here's actually the, the synth design. You can see how crazy complicated that is. I mean, you don't need to understand it. You just see how complicated it is. It's massive. Um, and that complicated design, imagine building that out of hand, dragging those boxes around in lines. It's a sort of, sort of nightmare. Um, and we've, we've actually developed it here with this piece of text here. So just this text here describes that full design. So when you're using text, you can actually use the power of programming languages to actually generate you something much more complicated and sophisticated from, from smaller parts. Um, and so we can hear what this sounds like, this spacey thing. So th this sound you're hearing now is just actually generated from this text here. And I can move my hand around and I can... That's pretty cool, right? And the nice thing about this is that I can show this to someone, and they can download it for free. They can play with themselves with any machine, laptop, uh, Macs, Windows, uh, Linux, and they can look at the source code, and they can read it and understand it and learn from it. Um, and so, how many, what are we doing for time? How long have we got left? Minutes. Right, cool. Um, conscious of time. So, and we can also use samples. So here's a sample set that someone's created for us, and there's something called freesound.org which is an amazing website where people have put up samples to be used in a Creative Commons license, so you can freely uh, use them. And Overtone, the system I'm working on, can just pull these down for you on the fly. Um, and so when you've got something like that, then playing a piano is something it's as simple as saying sample piano as a, as a function, and which is quite pretty cool, right? So I'm, I have a crazy, rolly piano with, with touch sensitive. I've got this nerd code, and I can just call piano like this. And it's a function, so in programming, that means I can pass different parameters and get it to do different things. So an obvious parameter to a piano is the note it's going to play. So I can change the number, and I can play different notes, and maybe this is a bit bigger. And you're thinking, like, why are you doing this? It's not nowhere near as intuitive as a real piano. But we can do amazing things. So first of all, I can start looking at abstractions. So I can say, well, I've got a note function, which instead of passing, like, a number, I can say C4. And it can then say D4. And so I can start to actually create a language for me to actually use to manipulate these things. Um, and then I can even do things like use programming code to map a function over a sequence, which sounds crazy to you. But a sequence could be a chord, for example. And mapping a function is an activity you do over a sequence, like playing each note in a chord. So I could go for each note in chord uh, C4, C5 minor. That's C4, probably nicer. Um, call the sample func piano function with a note, and I've got a chord I can play, and I can then, you can read it, and I can go to major, and I can even get like a scale, which is all the notes, which doesn't sound very good, obviously, but uh, you could put something like a sleeping thread in here. So I can start to actually write code which generates a thing. Now, this might sound very simplistic, and it is, because it's, it's an example, but the things you can do with this are pretty, pretty cool. Um, and you could even think, well, actually, the, the, the algorithms I could create to play the piano are pretty cool, but actually, I want to be able to play the piano directly. I want to have the ability to use my own uh, body and my fingers to actually do this. And one of the things we're fundamentally interested in is to what extent we can actually uh, uh, show and demonstrate to the audience our virtuosity. So when you go to electronic gig, you just see some people twiddling some knobs, and you don't really know if they press play or they're actually performing live. And the real test about that is if they can completely mess up. Because if you can't completely mess up, then it's not live. Right? Jimi Hendrix could all the time completely mess up. And actually, often, I think, completely burns and crashes. So if that happens, then we're demonstrating it's completely live. Um, and so you can easily build on these things. So I can say, have we got time for this? Yeah. Event, yeah, sure. debug. On. So I've got this event system, so when are we using these kind of controllers? It's sending messages to the system that we're using all the calls to do stuff with. Pretty high-tech computer science things. 
So when I press the keyboard, you can see all this, this nonsense on the screen, which is information which is going into the computer. But we can do something with this information. So I'm going to make this a bit smaller so I can actually do something with it sensibly. Um, let's find a note on events. Uh, that we want. So this is, the inf this is a special key to describe this, that particular piano connected to the machine. So I can say here, uh, on events, uh, open square brackets, that special key. I have a function. You don't need to understand this, but you can just see that I'm writing this stuff and it's not very long. Um, and then in that function, I'm going to print hello, uh, uh, tech music tech fest. Uh, and then I give it a good name, uh, foo, and then when you press the keys, it says, oh, I need to turn the event debug off as well. Now when I press the keys, it's saying hello tech fest, which is slightly more useful than that noise, right? So now we know that when I'm pressing the key, it's doing something, but that's still not very musical or very exciting. So let's just change it around. Let's, let's say, well, actually, we know that this message, or I know because I programmed it, so obviously, uh, contains the note we're playing. So I can extract the notes of the event that came into the system. And now we're doing it, when we press the keys, you can see now we've got the MIDI numbers, and if you can read that, but it's 55, 62, which is pretty cool, because actually now, instead of printing the numbers, we can play the numbers. We know we can play them, because we, we did it before. So if I call that with a sample piano, now we've got a piano. So it's pretty cool. I've demonstrated this to, to like 12-year-olds and 8-year-olds, and they go wild when they see this. Like, what? You can actually build a piano like this? And you can say, well, you don't need to stop there. So I can call that function, like a piano, but I can actually call it twice, perhaps. And I can add uh, five notes to it, and now I've got a chording thing. Um, if it's actually, there we are, I'll try that. So one note's playing a chord. So I can really start to extra play around and do things which ne not necessarily musical instruments have. And so by having the text and by having the full of environment to program in, I can really let my imagination run wild and build things. And it, this is exactly what it is like to be a programmer. It's pretty cool. So if you're thinking about being a programmer, you should definitely do it. It's pretty cool. So once we've got that going, then we can think about uh, dealing with effects. So we've got these very simple Korg little uh, cheapo uh, controller things. And so I built software on top of Overtone, which we use actually to develop uh, and do our music sets, which can deal with this. So let's get that going. Um, so uh, meta x dot sets dot ignite. It's pretty strange to see our band is actually a, a programming language environment. It's, it's pretty cool. Uh, so if I pull that in, actually now you see the monomes are lighting up, which is pretty cool. It's all getting ready and booting up. We've got to press these some buttons to tell it what's going on. And now I have another namespace, meta x dot kit dot mixers. Uh, mixers. If I, oh, meaty x. I've got to time everything precisely right, otherwise it doesn't understand. Um, and now I can pass the sample piano through an outbus, which is nx. Uh, S0, and so here I can, I've got control over the volume suddenly, and I can add reverb and all this kind of stuff. And the, the important thing here is that the, the synthesizer that's actually making the sound is something I've developed with language, which is freely available online that anyone else can play with and use, which is amazingly cool. And it's cool because other people, and they have done this, have read the stuff I've created and thought, well, actually, this could be improved. And they've sent me improvements, so my software is better. Um, so we can start playing with this. Uh, and then also, we can start using the monomes as sequencers as well. So then um, this is pretty cool. So we actually, uh, we can do what we want with this. So when we press a button, it sends an event, like the event from the keyboard. And we can do what we want with it. And so I built a very simple sequencer with this. So let's have a look at the sequencer going. Let's start some recording. Um, we should get some lights. There we are, some lights going. And so John can actually start to actually sequence some drums. And each of these drum lines happens to go through the same effects thing that the piano was going through. So we can start to actually start messing around with this. So. So we can start to hear now actually we're adding some reverb or whatever we want and playing around. And essentially this is what we do when we program. So we sit in a cafe in Cambridge every week and we actually just do this with headphones. And it's amazing the number of people come up and say, what, what on earth are you doing? You know, we have these crazy visuals. So I can, I can go to this thing here and I can actually run some visuals, which is in time with the music. So, so you actually see now we've got like visuals going on. So 
when people see me programming normally, they think, well, that's obviously boring. But when they see like programming with crazy visuals, that's obviously cool. And they come and ask us what's going on. And so we just keep doing this. And then we're going to do this now for another what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Until so thank you very much for listening. And uh, carry on listening, please.
Thank you very much. Thank you.